Avenue. A warm October afternoon. Nat's Bar. A little place is almost empty. Almost, not quite. And how is my very good friend Nat today? Yes, Mr. Boynum. This being an especially fine afternoon, and I having just acquired two lovely bottles, which you will perceive in this paper bag at my elbow, I have decided to ask for your hand in marriage. Look, Mr. Boynum, if that is to be your attitude, Nat, I shall have to drown my sorrows in a jigger of rye. Just one, that's all. Sorry, Mr. Boynum, no credit. Today, Nat, you'll be glad to know we can barter on a cash basis. You see? Legal tender. One straight ride, that was the idea. Okay, it's your funeral. First one always tastes rotten, don't it? Or maybe you never like the taste. Again. Say, uh, how about your brother? You told me you and him was going away for the weekend. Uh, we were, and in fact we are, on the 645. <laughs> unfortunately, most unfortunately, my brother Wick was called away by a business matter. <laughs> I just happened to remember a telephone call. Pretty sharp. And then you duck right out and spend your train fare for liquor, huh? Taking them two bottles with you? Oh, I may never touch them while I'm there. Not a drop. What you don't understand, all of you, is that I've got to know what's around. That I can have it if I need it, that's all. Yeah, I know a lot of guys like that. Take a bottle and put it on the shelf. All they want is just to look at it. Won't even have a corkscrew, just to be sure. Only all of a sudden, they grab the bottle and bite off the neck. And that. One more reproving word, and I shall consult our lawyer about a divorce. Let me wipe up the bar. That glass left a circle. No, no. No, don't wipe it away, Nat. Let me have my little vicious circle. You know, the circle is the perfect geometric figure. No end, no beginning. Weave me another, Nat. Oh, come on, Nat. One little jigger of dreams. Nope. You don't approve of drinking? Not the way you drink. You're worried about me, huh? Well, don't be, Nat. Just, just think what it does to my mind. It tosses the sandbags overboard so the balloon can soar. Suddenly I'm competent, supremely competent. I'm one of the great ones. I'm Michelangelo molding the beard of Moses. I'm Van Gogh painting pure sunlight. I'm Barrymore before the movies got him by the throat. I'm a hold-up man. I'm Jesse James' brothers. I'm all three of them. I'm W. Shakespeare. And out there, it's not Third Avenue any longer. It's the Nile, Matt. The Nile. And down it moves the barge of Cleopatra. Listen. Purple the sails, and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, which to the tune of lutes kept stroke, and made the water which they beat follow back. Keep it up, Tom. More lines and more. The whole little circle's on the bar. Three, five, eight, nine. Till so suddenly you realize it's late. Now grab your bottles and hurry home, but don't go in yet, Tom. Look up there first. Look up. All your windows dark. Quick, must have gone. Sure, he'd be mad enough to go away alone. But Helen, Helen may be around. Watch out, she doesn't see you sneaking in. All right, you're in. Now lock the door. Slip the catch. So far, so good. No, no, wait a minute. Those bottles, they've got the high one down. That's it, that's fine. In the ceiling light, in the metal ball. Now sit the other bottle by the chair and pull out that cord. And fill the glass. Mr. Burnham, I thought you was going away. I have the usual. Look, Mr. Burnham, this is still morning. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. It's when you need it most in the morning. Haven't you learned that yet? At night it's a drink, in the morning it's medicine. I'll have another jigger of tonic. How about those two quarts? Did you polish off both them bottles last night? Both? Hey, that's right. I did have two bottles, didn't I? I hid one of them. I've still got it. I'm a capitalist, Ned. I got untapped reserves. I'm rich. Mr. Burnham, <laughs> if you had enough money, you'd kill yourself in a month. Don't make no difference to me. But it sure is tough on that girl. What girl? The one in the leopard coat. She was in again last night, looking for you. That's an awful high-class young lady. You bet she is. How the heck she ever get mixed up with a guy that sops it up like you do? Yeah, it's a problem, isn't it? That nice young man who drinks and a high-class young lady, and why does he drink and why doesn't he stop? That's my novel, Nat. Morbid stuff. Nothing but the book of the month club, a horror story, the confessions of a booze addict, 
the lug book of an alcoholic. Oh, come on, that breakdown. I'm empty again. You know what I'm going to call my novel? The Bottle. That's all. Very simple. The Bottle. Get it all in my mind. Let me tell you the first chapter. The man with the bottle meets a girl. Extra special girl. He meets her, makes a date, goes on the wagon for six weeks. He's in love, huh? That's what's going to be so hard to write. Love is the hardest thing in the world to write about. So simple. You've got to catch it through details. The early morning sunlight hitting the ash cans in front of our house. A ringing telephone that sounds like Beethoven's pastoral. A letter scribbled on our office stationery that smells like all the lilacs in Ohio. And no drinking? He thinks he's cured. If he can find a job now, they can be married, and that's that. But it isn't that. Not quite, because... Fill me up, and I don't tell you why. You see, it's a few months later now, and she's written the folks all about the fellow. They've come all the way from Ohio to meet him. He's supposed to be at their hotel at noon. But suddenly he's scared. He knows he can't face him. Not like that, not cold. He needs a drink, just one. And so he takes just one. And then another, and then another. And then all of a sudden it's five o'clock and he's still there at home with his bottle. He's drunk. He's blind. And when the girl comes up to find out what's happened, that's how she finds it. Don, I understand. Of course I do. You were a little nervous about meeting my folks, so you took a few drinks. What of it? Most people drink a little. Sure. The lucky ones who can take it or leave it. But then there are the ones who can't take it and can't leave it either. Helen, what I'm trying to say is I'm not a drinker, I'm a drunk. Darling, we can go over this tomorrow. Right now. You've heard the facts. That's all there is to it. I've heard them, and they're not very pleasant. But they could be worse. After all, you're not an embezzler or a murderer. You can be cured. That has a familiar ring to it. There must be some reason why you drink. The right doctor can... I'm way ahead of the right doctor. I know the reason. The reason is me, what I am. Or rather, what I'm not. What aren't the... What aren't you that you want to be, Don? A writer. Silly, isn't it? Because I could be. I was. Until that guy started looking over my shoulder and whispering in a thin, clear voice like the E string on a violin. Don Burnham, he'd whisper. It's not good enough. How about a couple of drinks just to put it on his feet, huh? So I had a couple. That made all the difference. Suddenly, I could see the whole thing, the tragic sweep of the great novel, beautifully proportioned. But before I could grab it and throw it out on paper, the drink would wear off and everything would be gone. And there was despair. And a drink to counterbalance despair. One to counterbalance the counterbalance, that guy would be always at my shoulder. What guy? Who are you talking about? The other Don Burnham. There are two of us, you know. Don the writer and Don the drunk. I try to break away from that other one a lot of ways. Once I even hocked my typewriter and bought a gun. <laughs> yeah, still got the bullets. Don! I meant to do it on my 30th birthday, but that other Don wanted us to have a drink first. He always does. The gun went for three quarts of whiskey. The flop suicide of a flop writer. But you are a writer. You have every quality for it. Wit, imagination, pity. Oh, come on. Let's face reality. I'm 33. I've never done anything. I'm not doing anything. I never will do anything. Zero, zero, zero. But you will. We'll straighten all this out. Helen, for your own good, you'd better go. Sit down. I'm going to make some coffee. Go on. Clear out. Clear out while you can. Because I've got a rival? Because you think you're in love with a bottle? You don't know me, Don. I'm going to fight and fight and fight. And don't try and argue. Bend down and be kissed. That was three years ago, Matt. That's a long time to keep fighting, to keep believing. The sanatorium, the health farm, the psychiatrist, nothing worked. And still she holds on. She knows she's clutching a razor, but she won't let go. Three years of it. Yeah, and how does it come out? I don't know. I haven't figured that far. Want me to tell you? Well, one day your guy gets wise to himself and gets back that gun. Or if he's only got a dollar ten, he goes up to the top of the Empire State Building, way up on top, and then... Or he can do it for a nickel in the subway under a train like that. But what if Helen's right after all? He sits down and turns out something good, but good, and that pulls him up and snaps him out of it. This guy? Not from where I sit. Oh, you're wrong, Nat. I'm going to do it. That's why I didn't go on that weekend. See, this time I've got it, Nat. I'm going home. I'm going to write. <laughs> The 
second act of The Lost Weekend, starring Ray Milland, Jane Wyman, and Frank Phelan, will follow in just a moment. Mm -mm. The San Francisco atmosphere. Superb service. What more could there be? At Frisco's own place, there's a whole lot more. From the complete menu, ribs to wings, and steak to hamburger. And it's also the home of Saturday and Sunday jazz in the Golden Horseshoe. Frisco's Old Place, fully licensed, great food and jazz. Saturday, 1.30 p.m. till 5.30 p.m. And Sunday from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. Frisco's Old Place, 760 Brand Street, Burlington, in the Burlington Square. What more could you want? If you can't make it to Frisco's, listen to Saturday Night Special, James for Jazz Presentation, Norm Bernard and his band, on tape from that afternoon. weekend. The Burnham apartment, the living room, the portable typewriter on the desk. Two shaking hands slip a sheet of paper in the machine and slowly, grimly begin to type. The bottle, a novel by Don Burnham. For Helen, with all my love. With all my love. Stop it, stop it, I'm all right. I just can't stop, stop it! Sure, Don, sure, you're all right. All you need is a drink. One drink this morning, you'll be fine all day. Tough luck, though, bottle's empty. Any money? Not a dime. Nat got it yesterday. No credit either, no nothing. Unless you want to use that portable. Why not? Why don't you, Don? Why don't you give it to Ned? Why don't you get some good out of it? Now you're talking. Rip the paper out. Slap on the lid and let's get going. Sure, I know you're weak and the thing's heavy. But it's only to Ness. Just a block and a half. Come on, start walking. You need the drink, boy. Ned. Ned. Mr. Boynum, what's the matter? Let me have one, Ned. I'm dying. Just one, please. I thought you were home right in that book. Oh, he tricked me. The same old dirty trick. Give me one, Ned. I'll pay you when I can. I just, just don't let me die here. No credit, and you know it. All right, so it's charity. I'm begging for you, one, Ned. Just, just give me one. Yeah, one. One's too many, and a hundred's not enough. Here. Ned. That's all. Oh, please, please. I'll pay you. I'll let you have my typewriter. I'm no writer. You're the writer. Now go on home. Go home. And you better take something to quiet yourself. You're heading straight for the DT. I'm not, I'm not. 
That's what they all say until they start seeing the little animals. Oh, shut up! You know that stuff about pink elephants? That's the bunk. It's the little animals. Little tiny turkeys in straw hats. Midget monkeys coming through the keyholes. With one guy, I know it used to be beetles. Beetles crawling all over them in the dark. That's when it comes, you know, in the dark. Oh, stop it, stop it! Matt, please, please, just one. I'll die if you don't. You'll die if I do. Here, five bucks. But drink it up somewhere else. I don't want that kind of money here. Downstairs phoned me. She promised she'd let me know when you came home. She heard you scream. Go away. Go away. Oh, silly, I came to help you. Come on, now get up. Put your hand on my shoulder. No, wait, we need some light. No, Helen, no. What's wrong, Doc? The wall, don't look. What wall? There, over there, the mouse in the bat, that hole in the wall. There isn't any hole in the wall, no. But I saw it, I saw it. I... You had some kind of nightmare. Stop shaking, John. Everything will be all right. I'll stay right with you. You'll get some food and sleep. Little animals. It's always the little animals. That's what he said. That's what he said. But you're not making much sense. What he said about the ending. It's like this. Or like that. Like this. Or like that. Darling, what you need is a good night's sleep. They're more than ready for spring. What is your car? Is it longing for a lube job, ailing for lack of alignment, itching for an ignition tune-up? King Car Service Center is the spring tonic for your car. Call King Car and arrange for a checkup to give your car the pep it lacks. You're ready for spring. Make sure your car is. King Car Service Center. Five certified mechanics and guaranteed workmanship. 185 Cross Avenue in Oakville, 842-5333. Come on, lazy bones, it's time to get up. I've got toast and coffee and scrambled eggs and... Don! Don, did you hear me? Don! Don, why don't you... Gone. He's not here, he's gone. Yeah? Oh, good morning, miss. Excuse me. Did someone come in here this morning to pawn... Yes, there it is, on the rack. That leopard coat. Huh? I want it back. It's mine. It's your coat. Oh, it's all right. He had my permission. How much did you give him? He didn't want any money. He wanted to swap it. For what? Something he hawked here a long time back. What? A gun. Don. Helen, how the devil did you get in? I got the pass key from the janitor. The safety latch wasn't on. What's the matter? Why are you looking about this way? No reason. I, I just wanted to be sure I left everything right. Well, I'd, I'd like to finish up a few things before Wick gets back. You'd better run along. And thank you. Don, there was some whiskey left when I cleaned up last night. Was there? Would you like to know where I put the bottle? 
No. Don't you want a drink, Don? No. It's right here in the umbrella stand. Why don't you, Don? I don't feel like a drink. Not now, I told you. Just one. Here's a glass, please. Say, what are you up to? Drink it, you need it, Don. I want you to drink it. I'll get you some more. I'll get you all you want. What kind of talk is that? I will, I mean it. I'd rather have you drunk than dead. Dead? Who wants to be dead? Don't lie to me. You have a gun and bullets. If those bullets aren't in this drawer... All right, they're not there. So what? This business is just a formality. Don Burnham is dead already. He died over this weekend. That's not true. It is. He died of moral anemia, of fear, of shame, of DTs. That Don Burnham. And now you want to kill the other one? What other one? There were two Dons. You told me so yourself. Don Burnham the drunk and Don Burnham the rider. It's just the drunk who died, so the rider's free. No one to whisper anymore. No one to interfere. Oh, stop trying to storm me. It's too late, Helen. What do you expect, a miracle? Yes, 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 if I could only make you wait. Who is it? It's me, Mr. Boynum. I got something for you. Come in, Nat. What is it? The other night at my place, you forgot your typewriter. Thought I'd bring it up. Thank you, Nat. Writes real good. I oiled her up a little. I didn't oil her up so you could hock it. I'll take it, Nat. Oh, sure. Well, goodbye, Mr. Burnham. And, uh, how's all them lilacs in Ohio? <laughs> Don, this is it. It happened. I didn't ask for a big miracle. Helen, you're not serious. Somebody is. Somebody somewhere sent this typewriter to you. Why? Because he means you to write. Write what? I tried. Couldn't even find the first line. Of course you couldn't. You couldn't write the beginning when you didn't know the ending. The end is a question mark, Helen. Will be as long as I live. Don't say that, Don. Give me a Helen. That glass, I'll take it now. Don. Don, you dropped your cigarette in that... Yes, Helen. There's a question mark after every story. Love. Will it last? Success. Does it bring happiness? Death. Is it heaven or hell or sleep? All right, this strength of mine, such as it is, will it hold out? We'll try. On behalf of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, thank you, Ray Milland, Jane Wyman and Frank Phelan for your deeply moving performances. Which bring us quite fittingly to the Red Book Magazine Awards for 1945. As you all know, Red Book Magazine annually awards the Red Book Cup for what it deems the outstanding screen achievement of the year. And it is Lady Esther's annual custom to invite one of the previous year's winning cast to make the presentation on behalf of Red Book. Last year's winner, of course, was Going My Way. And here in person is Barry Fitzgerald. Thank you very much. Well, I've just this to say. This is a beautiful cup, and Leo McCary, being Crosby and I, have valued having it for a year. Now it goes into other hands. And I'm sure that millions of people all over America will agree with Mr. Edwin Barmer, editor of Red Book, and Mr. Thornton Delahanty, its motion picture critic, that the cup is going to the proper people, the men behind the lost weekend. Jane, call the boys. Come on, Charlie. Come on, Billy. Go ahead, Ray. Introduce them. Ladies and gentlemen, our two-in-one boss, who between them wrote, produced, and directed the picture, Mr. Charles Brackett and Mr. Billy Wilder. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an honor indeed. In accepting it, Mr. Wilder and I want to thank the people who made the picture possible. Charles Jackson for his brilliant novel, the Paramount front office for giving us the green light, you, Ray, and you, Jane, and the whole cast, John Seitz, the cameraman, Don Harrison, the, e the editor, Miklas Rochard for his magnificent music. Billy, is there anyone I've forgotten? Ah, uh, yes. A word of thanks to the man who helped us with our research, to Mr. W.C. Fields, for graciously permitting us to peek at the x-rays of his kidney. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a minute, Willie. <laughs> Let's be serious. Uh, speaking for all who worked in it, let me say that 
we are proud that a story like The Lost Weekend should ever have been brought to the screen. We think it marks a forward step towards Hollywood's real coming of age. And if the screen can approach all human problems with this same sort of frankness, this same sympathy and this same desire to help, then Hollywood will have justified its place and its importance in our lives. And that's about all except for all of us. Thanks to Red Book, thanks to Lady Esther, and good night.